Uh, we have a treat today. We have uh, Reverend Bobby Becker here today, and she is a friend of St Reverend Stephen. I guess you've known him for quite a while, and Johanna. And so I really look, I haven't met her before. This is the first time I've met her, so I look really forward to, to listening to what she has to say. Uh, Reverend Bobby Becker is a retired senior medicine minister uh, from 27 years of managing a variety of programs and organizational functions. She is a graduate of California State University, Long Beach, with a degree in journalism and public relations, graduate studies in communications, and a master's in consciousness studies from the Centers for Spiritual Living School of Spiritual Leadership. Busy woman. In 2014, she retired to pursue a passion for speaking, teaching, and coaching through positive life practices for individuals and community well-being and prosperity. As well, she consults nonprofits, businesses, and individuals, purposeful strategic planning and leadership. Bobby is an assistant minister at the Spiritual Center for Spiritual Living, serving as in a broad capacity with a focus on orga organizational development, interfaith community efforts, and outreach to young adults. She leads the Gathering OC, which I'm sure we'll find out about, a contemporary service that is held once a month on the third Sunday. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Bobby Becker. Thank you. Well, good morning, see me. I love when I open my iPad because the first thing I see is my 11-year-old. <laughs> she reminds me of who I am. And it's usually not what I'm thinking in the moment, so that's even better, right? <laughs> right? No. Well, good morning. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I am a friend of Steve's, and hi, Steve. You know I, my prayers are with you and your mom. And um, we went to school together. And um, we immediately connected. He's just that kind of person, isn't he? He just kind of reaches inside and his heart touches yours and you really don't have a choice in the matter. So um, I'm sure you found that out. Um, and I appreciate that about him because he was fun for me in school. He, and, and sometimes in school, it's not always fun, right? So sometimes we needed that reminder to be fun because it, fun is that place where we really come out. We really are ourselves. They say the most present you can be is when you laugh. And I believe that, because I'm laughing, I'm in the moment, I'm in that moment of what I'm feeling. Today's topic um, that I'm speaking to, and I think I'm getting some feedback from this, so I'm just gonna hand that over there. Um, today's topic is about what is this discomfort? And I don't know about you, but I would say for the past nine months, I have been birthing discomfort. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and, and this is not about politics, I'm not gonna get there, but because this is not the place, nor do I choose to, it's just not who I am. But I've been really, really uncomfortable with a lot of things that I've seen, and part of that, and I I've, I've keep asking myself, you know, what is this discomfort that I'm having? And the more I ask myself, what is this discomfort, and the more I ask myself, how can I move from this discomfort, the more discomfort shows up. You've been finding that? Um, a few months ago, actually three months ago, um, I, was, I do a lot of interfaith work down in Orange County. And a lot of the interfaith wor work that I do is with the LGBTQ community. And I got a call, because I started this group called Kaleidoscope, and it's a group that creates sacred and safe space for the LGBTQ community in Orange County, because there's not a lot of it, or at least there's the perception of it. So remember that word perception for later. Um, and in that, I think what's really interesting is, as I've done this work, I've become more uncomfortable. So I get this call, and it's from Rancho Santa Margarita, their interfaith council, which I didn't even know existed, because I live right over the hill. I live in Tribuco Canyon, which is right by Mission Viejo. And I get a call, and they said, you know, we would like you to come and talk about the work you're doing, and the reason we'd like you to come and talk is because you happen to be gay. 
Now, that was really interesting for me because um, when I was in ministerial school, this, this common thing that kept coming up was I don't want to be this gay minister. And as I realized as I walked through that, I was walking through some of my own shame about what, what, what does that mean to be a gay minister? And I kind of laugh about it because, well, I am a gay minister. That's not all who I am, but there was that piece of it. And she said to me, she says, now the reason we want you to come is that the conversation that we're going to have is about intolerance and incivility. I thought, well, that's an interesting conversation. And we'd like you to tell a story about a time in your life when you experienced intolerance and incivility. And um, I knew of a story, and the story was really interesting be for me because I didn't necessarily want to tell that particular story. And um, what I really, really love about whenever I speak is the music that kind of happens right before that I'm naked, is that because when I, as a minister, one of the things that I'm practicing is about being naked. My vulnerability is what heals me. So I went to the interfaith uh, event, and I think I'm hitting something here, pardon me. I went to the interfaith event, and what um, my story was specifically is that um, when I was 30 years old, I was excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was excommunicated because uh, I came out. And I came out because I did not want to live a lie. That was the important thing. Not that, that I wanted, I did not want to live a lie. And we all, in our own lives, have to come out from a lie. <coughs> now, as I was getting ready to tell this story to this community, and most of the time in interfaith communities, the LGBTQ community is really not a conversation. It's usually race or religion. And I understand that. That's fine. I, 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 I strongly... Would you like me to switch? Yeah, we're going to switch you You know, I'm, I'm a switcher. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. As I was about to tell my story, what I did know is as people were walking in the room and I was getting prepared to tell the story, my story, I was really nervous, and I was nervous because I know that in the interfaith groups that a lot of LDS or Mormon folks are part of that group now, which I appreciate. I also was afraid that my story may not be appreciated. So as I was sitting there, I kept going back and forth whether I should tell my story. And I was really walking through some discomfort. So what I did decide to do was I decided that what was important was to tell the story that I know is true. The healing story. The story of my rebirth. The story of the fact that how, even though I was asked to leave one community because of revealing the truth of who I am, that that was the beginning of my journey in coming to understand that I am a child of God. And that no one can take that away. And that it, it gave me license or the freedom to really come to experience all the very beautiful aspects of what that means. And my, the story of leaving my faith was one of deep courage and commitment, and I had to surrender to its outcome. And, and, and I'm sure each one of you have had some kind of version of that. Because truly what I'm talking about is that each one of us go through something extremely uncomfortable, but as we walk through it on the other side is something beautiful. There's a gift in it. When we truly stand there naked, not necessarily in front of others, but in front of ourselves. I was thinking about that. Could I walk naked up here just earlier? And that, when I said I could switch, that wasn't one of them. Um, 
And I thought, what would that feel like? You know, what would that feel like? And um, in that moment, as I was sitting there, I said, you know, I could do it right now. That's my logical head, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how much you'd appreciate it, but <laughs> yeah, it's always one. <laughs> But Ernest Holmes, and, and I love this about discomfort, Ernest Holmes said this, nature will not let us stay in any one place too long. She will let us stay just long enough to gather the experience necessary to the unfolding and advancement of the soul. This is a wise provision. For, we should, stay, for should we stay here too long, we would become too set, too rigid, too inflexible, and I'm going to say this, too damn uncomfortable, or comfortable, too comfortable. Comfortable is fine. It gives us a place to kind of sit and rest, but too comfortable for too long is kind of what I'm talking about, where we don't allow ourselves to feel sort of the gifts that life has to offer. We don't allow ourselves to continue to grow in our, our authenticity. We become like what the status quo is telling us to be, which is a little box, fit in that little box, be in that little box, be that little box, and don't move outside that. Each one of us has some absolutely unique gift that blows that box up. And if we don't express it, if we don't share it, then we are robbing the, the universe, the planet, our world, the nation, our community of an important gift that moves us. Right now, our world is actually at this point, a tipping point, if you would. It does not take a majority of people to change our world. It only takes a tipping point, which is really only about 10 or 11% of us. We don't need a majority. When I say that is to create a world that works for everyone. We don't need everybody to do that, but we need us. We need each other. And we need to be who we truly are. And we need to walk through the shame and the discomfort of anything that is holding us back. Brene Brown, who I love because she speaks to the journey of all of us, is that shame is part of what we release. It corrodes the very part of us that believes that we are capable of change. So when we're afraid or we think we can't change, it's that shame within us that things that we don't have enough education, that we're not a particular, in a particular group of people, we don't have enough money, we're not, we're male or we're female, we're, we're gay, we're whatever it might be. Whatever it is that's within us that is holding us back, it's the shame within us that imprisons us. We cannot grow when we are in that shame. We cannot grow, and, 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 and I'll say this too, shame it tells us to walk around the discomfort. Shame tells us to bypass the discomfort. Shame tells us not to feel. Because shame tells us that if we feel it, that we're doing something wrong. I would say this, God, if God is everything, God is also all the feelings that we're uncomfortable with. All of it. And it is up to us to find what is God, the truth of it in our stories, in our beliefs, in our thinking, in what shows up in our lives. God is the substance of all that is. And that's where we look for it. That's where we look and in order to get there, I would, I, I'll, I'll say this. How many of you are just so appreciating social media right now? I mean, just loving social media. Hi, Jay. <laughs> social media is a place where what we're seeing is a lot of the feeling that, is, that needs to be healed. And what I'm finding is it's my spiritual practice of not jumping in there with my own opinion about what it should be, and what it shouldn't be, and how you should be, and how you should be, 
and how we all should be. It's an opportunity for me to listen and to hear the different story and to ask, tell me, as I would do if you were sitting right with me, as if in sitting right with me I take your hand and say, tell me, tell me what you're feeling. Tell me how you're feeling, really. Not what this news source is, not what this says. Tell me how you're feeling. What is this making you feel? Can I be in that space of that deep, beautiful, divine listener that knows that there is an unfolding that is happening in this moment, that I am not aware of its outcome, but I am aware of its divine nature? Yes? The very thing that we hide from, that very discomfort that we continue to feel, and everything that shows up that makes me really, really uncomfortable is my own stuff. It's my own stuff. And it's an opportunity for me to feel it. We don't like to feel, do we? We want to feel joy. We want to feel happy. We want, but to feel that beautiful happiness, that beautiful joy, I must, I must feel sorrow. I must feel sadness. To understand love, I must know fear. And I must come to practice and understand in my own life so that I heal me, and in healing the wounds that I bring, I heal the planet. Sometimes we, even in my own mind, I think I have to do so much more than that. And that's really what I get to do, and from there the answers come. Could you put up the slide of the oceans? There we go. How many of you? I just love waves. I love the ocean. I'm a surfer. <laughs> Amen, brother. I love the ocean. And what's really interesting about surfing is when I learned to surf, I was afraid of the ocean. So that's why I learned to surf. I was afraid of heights, so I went hike, learned to rock climb. That didn't go so well. <laughs> but in learning to surf, one of the things, there's a difference between these two waves, and the difference is this. This is a wave that's formed, and this is a wave that is unformed. And the art of surfing is, when I learn, when I learn to surf, the difference is you catch, as a surfer, an unformed wave. And how you do it is, I have a big board. I, I bought the biggest board I could buy, you know. And you're out in the water, and you look for these nice, beautiful, unformed waves that approach the shore. And you point your board in the opposite, in the direction that the wave is going, and you point your board absolutely perpendicular to it. Sometimes you might curve it a little bit depending on the size of the wave. But it's really facing. So if the wave is going this way, I point my board this way, or this way, or this way, depending on the wave. The next thing I do is I paddle my life, depending on the, the, how fast the wave is. But I get the speed of my board up to the speed of the wave. So far, so good. That does not guarantee anything. The thing that's really, really important about it is the next thing that happens. I'll explain the uh, llama on the surfboard in a minute. The next thing I do is I lean. And my speed is up. I'm paddling, and I'm, in, I'm, in the, and I'm right with the wave, and the wave picks up the back of my board. And just as the wave picks up the back of my board, I lean. I lean like my life depends on it. And most of the time as I lean, I don't even have to paddle much. The wave just carries me. If I don't lean, sometimes I catch it, sometimes I don't, but most of the time I don't. And as I'm leaning, if I lift up because I get, oh, I don't want this wave or I get scared or whatever it is, guess what happens? I come right off the wave. But when I lean and I just let go, oh, the beauty of that wave, it's like flying. And you go down that wave, and then you stand up, 
and, and you do whatever business you do on it, whichever is your preference, and you write it. This is life. This is playing the game of life, being in the flow of it. It is so amazing, one, that there are two things that I want to talk about that are here, or three things. One, we must have courage in life. We must have courage to get out there and play in it. Two, when we are out there riding this flow of life, we must commit to the wave. We must surrender to it. There is a beautiful surrender in this art of surfing that is life, which is, I don't have to make it happen, but I have to surrender to its flow. And I can't waffle back and forth, because guess what happens? I come off the wave, and I wait for the next, but I'm off of it, and I'm out of the flow of things, and I am not flying in my authenticity. I don't have to figure out how, I just have to surrender and lean. And I think what's really interesting about this time is there's so many choices to make. It's not about the right or the wrong choice. Just commit to one. Just commit to it. And when we commit to it, which is that leaning, we truly enjoy the best that life has to offer. We don't worry about the outcome. We don't worry about what the ride's going to be like. We commit to it, and we stand up as if it's the ride of my life. And what that means is sometimes on that ride, it is uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm not prepared for it. Sometimes I have to surrender to its motion and allow its form to form, and knowing that its form is always forming. It never ends. The story, whatever's happening in our lives right now, if it's something we don't like, it's not done. And the story is not necessarily the truth. It's just the truth that I've come to understand and learn. And it's up to me to, in essence, be vulnerable, to be naked, to understand its more divine truth. Wherever you're at right now in this experience that we're having as a nation, as a planet, we're the tipping point. We're riding the wave, and we're committing to it. And we're bringing our best, whatever that is. And we're surrendering to this divine idea that our best is all, all enough, that our best is all we have to do, and that as we continue to reveal greater and greater truth about who we are and the gifts we bring, our planet continues to heal. We do not have to play into an idea that what is happening isn't what's not supposed to happen, but that I'm part of its unfolding, and I can trust. I have folks that come to me occasionally and say, you know, I, I had um, prayers about what, what the outcome would be, or I've had folks that said my prayer was answered, or whatever it means. It doesn't even matter. The point of the matter, a prayer is never final. When we pray and when we work our spiritual practice, we work its unfolding. We contribute to its unfolding. We contribute to it because we surrender to the greater idea. Along the way, too, there's things we can do. We can have the courage, and I speak my heart. My heart, not my head. And sometimes when I speak from my heart, I say nothing. Because the honest, the most honest, the most authentic, and the language that is truly the language that is love is what the heart says. I don't have to figure out how. I never do. I just have to trust that there's a divine unfolding, and then I lean into it. Right now, we get to lean into it. We get to lean into all that is and not necessarily look at some of the things that are happening in our world or even in our own lives and think that what's happening isn't meant to happen. It's just our perception of it. And we work that. The world needs people who've survived mistakes, people who 
have had tragedies and trials to help the rest of us through. That's what we do because we know the truth. I mean, what would have happened if folks like Viktor Frankl had not experienced what he had experienced in World War II, concentration camps? He says, would I do it again? No. Would I want to do it again? No. But had I not experienced that, I could not be part of this healing. Power. Powerful words. Each one of us has a story that is unique to us that has brought us here in this room, in this moment, and in every moment after. Don't give up on your assignment. You're alive. At this point in history, for a specific reason, you are here. You are here. You are part of it. And every generation on this planet right now is part of what must happen. There is a joy in life, and there's also all those other feelings in life as well. And they are here for a purpose. They're part of us as who we are as humans, to have all those beautiful experiences. And this discomfort, this is the place where light enters. This is the part that opens us. This is the place where we grow the most, the deepest. And it's up to us to do, not only honor that for ourselves, to honor that discomfort, but also to honor it in others. To actually allow people to have the conversations that they're having. It's important for us to have this experience of bringing healing to our world by honoring all the feelings of who we are. My daughter is 11. I'm going to close with this. My daughter is 11, and um, she reminds me all the time um, when I'm uh, stuck on one opinion or another. She's amazing. One day she was going to a friend's house, and it was actually on the day of her birthday when I think we planned as the maximum number of activities you could in a 24-hour period. And... Um, she wanted to add this one, which is I'm going to go to my friend Kitty, and we're going to go hang out for a little while. And, well, and I said, that's fine. And she goes, what time do I have to be home? And I said, you have to be at home at, I don't know, 3 o'clock or whatever it was. It happened to be Halloween. And about an hour later, she texts me and says, what time am I supposed to be home? And I think it was like 2 o'clock. Three, and I'm thinking, I'm expecting the next answer. Can I stay till four? Can I stay till, you know, what kids do? Can I have more? That's what I'm thinking. She says, can I come home now? <laughs> I said, well, of course. Of course you can come home now. Is everything all right? She says, yeah, I'll tell you when I get home. So um, she comes home, and she, and, and this is what I love about Reese, and children in general, they are so easy with saying things like, I don't like what's happening, or I'm scared, or I'm feeling this, or I'm feeling that. They have this beautiful courage and vulnerability to just be naked with us, you know, and she said, I, I didn't really like what she was saying and what was happening, and I just thought, maybe I should just come home. Um, I probably would have stuck it out, you know, whatever it was, the details don't matter. But I think the really thing interesting about Reese is, um, in, in how beautiful she is, is she has no problem with speaking her heart. And she has no problem speaking this place of vulnerability and from that place of vulnerability. And I think that's why, especially this generation, they will move through healing so much faster than we are. And they will because and part of it's us. Because we've kind of laid a different groundwork for them. And there's a beauty in that generation that must be celebrated and must be honored because w they're taking it. They're taking the next phase of this, this world over. They truly honor the idea of surrendering. They commit to what they love, and they commit to, an ex to, to having the experience they're meant to have. 
So with that, I just say this. I encourage you, myself including, to look at what's happening in our world and to honor its, its path. To be in that space of allowing people to, there's a light being shown in a place that was dark. And it must be shown and it must be felt and it must be heard so that we can truly create that world that works for everyone. So will you join me in prayer? So Reverend Maggie's put in your prayer box. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's just come together in this knowing and feeling and sensing that there is this one power and presence that we call God. It is all there is. It is all things. It is all those attributes that we talk of, the joy and the love, the abundance. It also includes all those human qualities, which is the sadness and the sorrow and the suffering. It is all. And in every moment of life, as we, each one of us, in every moment of our lives, is a very event of that one mind. I just express that knowing, knowing that as we walk this time together, there is this healing, that healing going on, and that we are all part of that. We each play that beautiful role, and I just know that to be true. I also bless all those in our communities across this world, those that have expressed the prayer requests in this box, that wholeness, health, peace, surround and support all of us as it is us. And that each person that asks for prayer both here in this box and those that have not expressed it necessarily in physical form but in the mind, that we honor those prayers and those feelings knowing that peace surrounds and supports those prayers, those folks that offer up that request that ask for as we ask we receive so I just bless this beautiful community called Simi Valley knowing that in the mind of God this is the place where we come to remember and we do create the world that works for everyone I bless Steve his mother his beautiful mother Johanna and as they hold that light for his mother in her wholeness and healing that God is present everywhere. So with that, I express my gratitude, knowing that it is already done in that mind, that beautiful divine mind. I let it go, I let it be, and so it is. Amen. <laughs>